Hey folks, welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review. And today we're taking a look at the Shanling EM5, which has kindly been loaned to me by Melbourne Chi Fi Audio, and it's going to go back after this review with some level of reluctance from me, but also in some ways no reluctance from me, as I'll get to in this review. The EM5 here is an all in one preamp, headphone amp, streaming device, DAC, you name it, this basically does it. And it comes in at 849 US dollars, making it very affordable for what it's offering, assuming it performs well, and we'll get to that shortly. Before we get into the detail, let's take a quick look at the EM5, and then we'll come back to talk about specifications and key features. You feel like summer days to me, won't turn the sun rays. I hope that we are meant to be. You say nothing at all. Yet somehow I know your history Oh, come what may, I'm ready Picture frames, lavender pain They all live here Within this romance I get the chance To stop the run and be the lucky one The EM5 uses the AKM AK4 4493EQ DAC chip, which is generally a well-regarded DAC chip that's known to sound fantastic when well implemented. And in this particular setup, it's capable of decoding for us DSD512 and also PCM all the way up to 768 kilohertz. On top of that, there's MQA decoding. So if you're streaming from Tidal, which this can do, you can also enjoy the benefits of full MQA decoding. I say full decoding, I haven't looked into which level of unfolding it does, but I believe it's doing the whole lot for you. Moving beyond the DAC stage of this device, we've also got a built-in headphone amp, which is going to produce up to 1.6 watts into 32 ohms, so plenty of power to drive pretty much anything you're likely to try and drive with it. It might start to be a little bit stretched on, say, a Sasvara or an Abyss 1266, but it's going to have everything else covered. To help with that, we've got four different gain levels you can choose from, so you can adjust it to be suitable for everything from IEMs all the way through to those more difficult headphones, depending on just how difficult we're talking. We'll do a device tour in a second, so I'll talk about the inputs and the outputs from an audio point of view. But before we get there, let's talk a bit more about what's going on inside the device. A few other things worth noting is that you've got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities here. And that means you've got access to DLNA streaming, AirPlay, you can connect it up to your local NAS drives. And then on top of that, the range of streaming services available is nothing short of excellent from this, and we'll get to that shortly. Pulling all that together through the top screen that we'll talk about as part of the tour is an Android operating system, but it's set up in such a way that it completely bypasses Android's generally questionable processing of audio and allows a much more pure connection of any inputs of this, whether it's a Wi-Fi, a network input, or one of the hardware inputs. It's going to allow a perfect connection of those through to the DAC, onto the amplification stage, and then out to whatever your devices are. And so on paper, the EM5 has a lot going for it, particularly with the price tag of $850, US but not everything is quite perfect, as we'll talk about soon. Before we get to that, I do want to give you a quick tour of the device, because that's where we start to piece together all the puzzle of what's good and what's not so good about the EM5. So let's do a quick tour now. On the front of the device here, we've got multiple headphone outputs. So you've got an XLR output, you've got a 4.4mm balanced output as well, so the XLR is balanced, the 4.4mm is balanced, and we've got a 6.3mm single-ended output. Other than that, the only other thing is the control knob and the power light. So the control knob is your volume, it's also your on-off button and your wake from standby button. And the little indicator light just tells you what state the device is in, whether it's completely off, in which case the light is red, or whether it's on and maybe in standby mode, or maybe the screen's active, and in those circumstances it's blue. Moving on from the front panel, we're going to go to the back and then come back to the top. Looking at the back of the device now, and there's a little bit going on here. Along the top row of the back of the EM5, we've got the various digital inputs. So you've got coaxial, optical, USB, we've got Ethernet. There's a USB-A socket there, which my understanding of that socket is it's purely to connect up to something like an external hard drive. I haven't tested the EM5 connected to an external DAC via USB, and the fact that the USB-A connection is in the input section, not the output section, makes me assume it's not for use with an external USB DAC. So you've got a few different digital inputs there. Down the bottom, you've got a couple of digital outputs, so you can take coaxial or optical and feed it to an external DAC if you want to. And then we've got our analog outputs in the form of RCA and XLR outputs. Before we get over to the end here, where there's a mains connection and your power switch. So there's nothing too surprising or extravagant on the back of the device, but it does go to show you just how many different ways you can use this, either as an all-in-one device, as a DAC and preamp through those analog outputs, or of course you can just use it as a streamer, sending the signal to an external DAC. So very, very versatile in that regard. The one final type of connection is on the side of the device. And just here you can see there's a micro SD socket. 
and that's going to allow you to put your music on a micro SD card and play it back as a local file. So lots and lots of different options for the EM5. And so finally we come to the top of the device and this is where in theory you're going to be able to control everything that's going on. And this brings me to what I find to be the first concern I have about the EM5. Placing the screen on top makes sense because it's really the only place on the device to get this much landscape for a touch control screen. But the problem with that is, unless you're actually sitting on top of the device like I am now, it's really not a good position. If I push the device back over to where I would normally use it at kind of arm's length, then actually seeing the screen and interacting with it becomes really tricky. And so anytime I've wanted to interact with the EM5, I've had to lean right forwards and kind of look down on the device as to see what I'm doing. So it's not a great position. I understand it's kind of the only position they could have put it, but it's almost like it needed to be on a tiltable angled screen so that you could lift it up when you've got it further away from you. And then of course that changes the whole design. It's going to add cost. So I get why they haven't done it, but it's not particularly good from an ergonomics point of view. The good news is that Shandling have kind of thought about that because they've built in the ability for the EM5 to do what's called wireless projection. And that means that if you're using the Edict app on your phone, your Android, or I'm assuming iPhone as well, then you can actually cast the screen in real time across your phone and get all the same functionality. And that definitely does work better, but it's a little bit laggy. So if you want a less laggy experience, you have to use the screen on the top of the device. But if you're happy with a little bit of lag, then you can get around the slightly poor positioning of the screen if you've got the device further away from you. The other thing about the device being set up this way is that if you're using it from a distance as, say, a streamer and preamp type function, you can't actually see from the front panel what's going on at all, so you're going to be 100% reliant on your smartphone. So there's a few things here I'm not a huge fan of. It's not deal-breaking stuff, but it is a little bit of a fiddle. Trying to work out what gear you should buy next? Have a look at the Passion for Sound Recommends link down in the description below. Clicking on the link will take you through to my Patreon page and specifically a post where you can click on the Airtable image to go through to my recommended product database. Once you're in the database, you can use the filter button up the top to choose which sorts of product types you want to have a look at. Maybe headphones, maybe DACs, maybe amps. Choose the one or ones that you want to see from this list. And then you can also sort the list by price if you want to or other features as well. You'll then see a consolidated list just of the product types you want to have a look at, including things like what the retail price was when I last checked. You've got links to my reviews of each product, and then also links to where you can go and buy them. Feel free to play around with the filters and sorting options as much as you like to find the gear you're looking for, and I hope that this database points you in just the right direction for you. So happy hunting, happy listening, and now let's get back to the review. While we're talking about some challenges I had, I'm just going to get them all out of the way now. This is not a complete bagging of the EM5 because there's a lot to like as I'll talk about in a minute. But while we're talking about some of the negatives, let's cover them all off in one chunk. I've talked about the positioning of the screen. I've talked about the fact that the Wi-Fi projection is a little bit laggy. So if you are using the smartphone as your interface, it's not as good as the direct connection. And by direct connection, I mean like the direct interactions with the screen. And then while we're talking about the interface, there's a source button, one of the bubbles on the screen. So you'll see in the B-roll footage here that on the actual screen, there's these two kind of goldy beige colored buttons or bubbles, and they can be moved anywhere on the touch screen, which is good in one way because they get in the way all the time. There's no place that I found that was good to put them where it didn't sometimes get in the way of a different button or a different thing I wanted to interact with, but at least you can move them out of the way when you need to get to particular parts of the screen. The problem was that what I found was the source button in the bubble form did absolutely nothing. No matter how I tried to use it, after the firmware upgrade, I can't remember before the firmware upgrade I did, if it worked better, I have a feeling it did. But after the latest firmware upgrade that I applied to the unit while I had it here, the source button seemed to stop working entirely. And so there's this wasted bubble of a button on the screen that does absolutely nothing I could find. Instead, when I wanted to switch source, I had to swipe down from the top of the screen and find that there's a few extra buttons in there. And this is something that drives me a little bit nuts about both Android implementations, but just generally these customized UIs, is that what you'll often find is that one lot of settings is in one location, say the main screen, but then there's other settings, and they're often really important ones, that are hidden behind a swipe down or a swipe in from the side type menu, and it really drives me nuts. I've looked all through the main menus for a source changing option, I've been pressing at the source bubble for ages, nothing happening, and then eventually I remembered about the swipe down, and in there you've got things like your gain control, your source switching, etc. So for me it's a bit of a bum that they're hidden there, I don't know if that's a limitation of the way the Android software works, even though this is kind of a custom built version using Android as the base, it still might be limited by Android, and that's a real shame if it is. 
Another thing that I wasn't a huge fan of is that they've built in these lovely VU meters in the EM5, so you can either see on screen what's playing at the time, or you can actually use the VU meters, but those VU meters only seem to work with local playback. So they're not going to be active from DLNA playback, they're not going to be active for direct streaming from Cobas or Tidal, it's really only going to work if you've got a micro SD card installed with songs, and or probably if you're using an external hard drive, which I haven't tested. But my guess is that anything where the source files are directly accessible by the device, maybe then it's going to work. It definitely works for local files, but it definitely doesn't work for Cobas, Tidal, DLNA, any of those sorts of things. And so that's a bit of a shame. It's not a deal breaker again, but it is a little bit of a shame for me. And so generally what I found as I played with the EM5 was that the interface isn't bad once you get past some of those quirks I talked about, knowing where to look for different settings, that's all fine. The app's not bad to use, but I'm not a fan of the way it sort of segregates different functionality. I found that sometimes I couldn't quickly and easily get to the source that I wanted. It took multiple steps to get there is what I'm saying. What I also found was that at another time it just completely dropped its ability to connect to the network until I rebooted it, and nothing had been done in the meantime. Every other device in the home was working fine, but the EM5 had just frozen up. It still showed me Cobas, and I'm guessing it was coming from the cache within the device. It still showed me Cobas as if I was connected, but once I actually started trying to play back a file, then it kept telling me it had lost the network. So as I said, I had to do a full reboot of the device, which doesn't take too long, but it's a little bit of a hassle that it's even necessary. And so for me, the software in the interface is buggy, it's not ideal, I would have liked it to have a Rune readiness as well, this doesn't show up on Rune, other than maybe it's an AirPlay device, but then you're actually getting a drop in sound quality, so it's not an ideal streaming device from that point of view. But if you're happy to use Cobas direct through the device, meaning that you're going to use your phone or the touchscreen here to control it, I say Cobas, what I mean by that, sorry, is any streaming service, and this pretty much has all of them, whether it's Spotify, Amazon, Tidal, Cobas, QQ Music... I'm probably forgetting something on there. It's got everything I could think of in that list. If you're happy to use those streaming services, it does work pretty well. And if you're predominantly just using those streaming services, in other words, if you're going to go to Tidal and stay there or Cobas and stay there, it works really nicely in that regard. And so from that point, we get to how it sounds. And the good news is that the EM5 sounds wonderful. It's a really excellent sounding device and one that from a general point of view, I would say sound quality wise, I'm absolutely going to recommend this. It's going to come down to more if you're happy with the way it works and if you're happy with the type of sound that it delivers, they're going to be the decision making factors, not whether or not it sounds good. And so with that out of the way, let me talk about some of the different ways I tested the sound so you can better understand if it's a good fit for you. Using the EM5 as an all-in-one device, and what I mean by that is that I was using the headphone output directly from this, I used it for streaming, I used it for local files, but always direct through the headphone output into a pair of headphones, and I tried different headphones, mostly the Meza Elite, but I moved through a few different ones as I was trying out different headphones. And what I found was that regardless of what I listened to, it always sounded fantastic. The sound is clean, it's detailed, it's got a lovely sense of staging, not a lot of depth as is fairly common, but a really nice sense of left-right space, and it wasn't a wall of sound. There was some degree of depth, it wasn't all completely split, but the sound stage was definitely wider than it was deep. I described the tonality from the EM5 as what I'd probably say is a detail-focused tonality. So it's bringing out a lot of detail, a lot of texture, but it's not sterile at all. It's what I would call detailed neutral. There are some devices that kind of get a little bit too aggressive, a little bit too sort of dry or clinical. The EM5 never did that. It gave me a great sense of all the detail and the clarity of the music, but it was still very enjoyable to listen to. So in that sense, I think it sounds fantastic. It might not be the best fit for those of you that have very analytical headphones. That's going to be a personal preference thing, but it's certainly not overly coloring the sound. It's not pushing it towards sterile or pushing it towards clinical. And therefore, if you're happy with how your headphone sounds, this is just going to continue to deliver the music through those headphones in the same way without giving it any particular color. That of course had me wondering how the DAC and the amp within the EM5 were kind of working together. And so the best way for me to work that out was to separate it out and use the DAC only within the EM5, feeding an external headphone amp. That meant running a pair of XLRs out of the EM5 into the Burson Soloist GT and seeing how it sounded. And the good news is that what I was hearing from the Soloist GT was very similar to what I heard from the onboard headphone amp. Not in terms of maximum sound quality, the Soloist GT is still a far better headphone amp. But in terms of tonality, they were very, very similar. And so what that means is that the amplifier in the EM5 is a very solid amp. It's giving you a good access to the performance of the DAC inside. It's not holding back the DAC. It's not adding any color, either neutrality and sterility, or going warm in the other direction. It's just being honest and transparent, and that's fantastic. 
Certainly, if you do go to a higher quality amp like the Solus GT, you can extract just a bit more detail, a bit more resolution, a tiny bit more space from the sound compared to the internal amp, but it's a fairly small step. And that's great. It means that you've got a well-paired amp and DAC that are getting the most out of working with one another. And so at this point, I was really impressed with the EM5. Putting aside a couple of the little kind of minor gripes I had with the interface, beyond that, I think it's a fantastic device that was sounding great. But at this point, as is often the case with my reviews, everything was out of context, I'd only been listening to this on its own, and so I wanted to see how it really compared against some competition. And the closest thing that I have here in my house that is competition to this would be the Matrix Mini i3 Pro. The Mini i3 Pro costs a bit more money, and in some ways it's a bit less featured, in other ways it's got more features. What I mean by that is it's not a standalone streaming device, it doesn't have the interface capabilities to connect you directly to Cobas, Tidal, Spotify, etc., and it doesn't have things like the card reader or the ability to connect to a, say, a NAS drive or something like that because there's no way to navigate it. So it's more of an endpoint type streamer rather than an all-in-one streamer. But on the other hand, it's also Rune ready. So if you are a Rune user, the Matrix Mini i Pro 3 can be a better choice or Mini i3 Pro. That could be a better choice if you're a Rune user and you're not looking for the onboard control of the streaming. Beyond that though, they're quite similar. They've got internal headphone amps. They've got the ability to output as a DAC or a line output. And so I wanted to test both of those functions. Firing them up first of all as all-in-ones, I put the Mini i3 Pro with its headphone output. It's got a 4.4mm, so I used 4.4mm for both of these. And so I tested the Mini i3 Pro up against the EM5 with no other devices in the chain. I was using the Mesa Elites for this test, and as I said, in both cases the balanced outputs. What it showed me is that the EM5 is a more left and right presentation, whereas the Mini i3 Pro probably gives you a little bit less width in left and right, but maybe a touch more depth. At the same time, the Mini i3 comes across a little bit smoother. There's a little bit less sense of texture and detail compared to the EM5. And so I think when comparing the headphone amp stages, the Mini i3 Pro is a little bit warmer, a little bit smoother. I think the EM5 is probably the technically more capable, stronger type device. And that's if you're using it just as an all-in-one driving your headphones. And for me, based on my past experiences with the Mini i3 Pro, I'm going to put that down to the fact that the Mini i3 Pro amp stage isn't great. It's not bad, but it's definitely not fantastic. The Mini i3 Pro is a device that I love using as a preamp with a pair of active speakers or feeding into an external amplifier to give you a better quality of amplification. And in that regard, I think if you were looking for a device like one of these that's predominantly going to drive your headphones directly, then the EM5 is the better choice unless you absolutely want room readiness. But what if you're going to use them as a DAC? If you're going to use them as a DAC or a preamp that's going to then feed out to external amplification or speakers, that was my next question to see if the amplifier stage was maybe holding back the Mini i3 Pro, and in that sense, maybe if you switch the functionality you need, the Mini i3 Pro takes a step ahead. And indeed, when I hooked them both up to the Burson Solus GT as my amp, and had them both fitting into that with level matching, and then being able to switch back and forth with exactly the same track going to both amps, or going to both devices I should say, in that sense, the margin became much smaller between these two, but it didn't disappear entirely. The Mini i3 Pro is still the slightly smoother, slightly warmer sounding device, but it's a much tighter margin when you're taking a line output rather than using the front headphone outputs. The EM5, therefore, is still slightly more textural in its sound. It brings out a little bit more of the detail, but it's a very tight margin again, as I've said. In terms of staging, I felt like the Mini i3 Pro was bringing everything just a little bit closer to me as a listener. It wasn't closing in the sound stage, it wasn't making it smaller, but it was making it feel like I was a seat or two closer in the audience to the performance. And that could be just down to the fact that the actual presentation, the tonality, has a bit more weight to it. There's a tiny bit more warmth and body in the sound, and that can make things sound bigger in the sound stage, and therefore because they sound bigger, they sound closer. And that's really the only significant difference. It's that slightly warmer, smoother sound, and the change in perception that it creates. As I move through lots of different tracks, and you'll notice that I'm not specifying any tracks here because I went through so many different tracks with all of these because they were streaming devices in particular. I was just constantly scrolling through tracks. And the only other thing I'd call out is that as I move through them more and more, I found that the Mini i3 Pro was consistently giving me what I call a creamier vocal. For those of you that love a vocal that's got a bit of richness to it, not warmth and thickness, but just that lovely sense of creamy kind of resonance, that the sort of chestiness, if you like, that's where the Mini i3 Pro brings that out. Whereas the EM5 tends to tilt more towards the air in the vocals. So if you like an airy sound to your vocals, the EM5 is preferable. If you like that slightly creamier sound, maybe a bit less air and a bit more of that chest sound, then that's where the Mini i3 Pro comes forward. 
But ultimately, I guess what I'm saying here is that both devices are fantastic. And so I think for the price, unless you need rune readiness, I don't really see a reason to buy the Mini i3 Pro over and above the EM5. They're different devices with different aesthetics. I definitely prefer the simplicity of the Mini i3 Pro. It's the device that I'll be very happily keeping because I like the fact that it's rune ready and I like the simplicity of its interface. And from that point of view, just to reiterate what I'm saying, I think both are interchangeable from a sonic quality point of view, particularly if you're using an external amp. If you're using it as an all-in-one, the EM5 for me is a step above, and that's fantastic because it's cheaper. And then again, of course, if you're looking for the ability to stream direct through the device and control your Cobras, your Tidal, your Spotify, your Amazon HD, whatever it might be, through the actual device, then the EM5 is a no-brainer. For $850, US it's performing as a DAC and headphone amp combo with streaming, as well as anything up to around $1,000, maybe even a bit above. So I think it's fantastic value for what it's offering. I'm not a fan of the ergonomics and the layout of it, but I also understand why they've done it. And I understand that there's probably some limitations from the Android software. And so with all that said, I actually think that the AM5 is a bit of a winner. I think it's a fantastic device. I think it generally looks and feels excellent despite the positioning of the screen. The Sonic performance is nothing short of exceptional for an $850 US dollar unit. And so if you can live with some of the slight kind of, I wouldn't say glitchiness, it wasn't glitchy software, but the slightly clumsy software, then I do think it's one you should consider. Shanling continue to impress me. I've tried a number of their devices over the last couple of years, and they continue to put out really solid sounding devices. They've got a nice balance between detail and clarity, but still what I'd call musicality, a touch of richness and warmth, just enough to balance the detail so it never becomes sterile or clinical or fatiguing. And I think the EM5 is a great example. So if you are in the market for a streamer and or if you're after an all-in-one that's future-proof with streaming capabilities, then the EM5 is absolutely worth considering, I think. So thanks again for Melbourne Tri-Fi Audio for sending this unit out. I'm not going to be unhappy to send it back, as I said at the beginning, because I've got the Mini i3 Pro, but it is a device that if I needed something like this in my life, I'd be chatting to them about buying it because I really do like what the EM5 offers. And so I hope I've been able to provide some clarity for you about where it's good, where it's maybe not so good, how it might fit your life and what you're doing. And as always, if you have found the review useful, I'd love it if you hit the like button and consider subscribing and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. But for now, let me leave it to the music. So happy listening and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Mm -hmm.